So hopefully you appreciate now that uh, in order to uh, predict whether, whether a given um, process is spontaneous or not, you don't just depend on delta H, you also take a look at delta S. Uh, negative delta H's and positive delta S's would ultimately um, uh, be favorable towards uh, towards uh, delta uh, G being negative because you know delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So if the delta H is negative and this guy is a positive, that means the T delta S will overall be negative. Two negatives will make a negative and uh, that will be a negative delta G as well. Um, so again, realize it is delta G of the uh, of the system which is going to ultimately decide whether a given reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. Um, but overall processes should occur if they are going to increase the delta S of the universe. So if that increases, the the entropy is rising for the universe, and so that spontaneous process will take place. So just to again, you know, reiterate, uh, realize that universe is a combination of the system and surroundings, right? So it's a possibility that maybe your system is, uh, uh, the, 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 the entropy of that increases, uh, but then it's a possibility that the surrounding decreases and so overall if you combine the two you would see that there will be a net uh, decrease in the case of a universe so so if this is surrounding and this is system so such a process is going to be non-spontaneous because uh, or more most likely be non-spontaneous because uh, the entropy of the universe is not rising, uh, it's decreasing. So uh, possibly under very low temperatures, we might probably see this uh, to be to be a negative value. But other than that, there is a good uh, high high likelihood that. Uh, the reaction is going to be non-spontaneous. Uh, on the other hand, if you have um, if you have an increase in entropy for the system and the decrease in entropy of the surrounding, the overall for the universe is going to still be increasing, and that process is going to be spontaneous. So again. Uh, the entropy of the system uh, for a spontaneous process, um, it is the entropy of not the system, but rather the universe, which increases. And so it's the criterion for spontaneity is the entropy of the universe. And processes that do increase the entropy, those that result in greater dispersal or randomization of energy will occur uh, spontaneously. Now, uh, to better understand, um, you know, this um, uh, increase in entropy uh, in a direction that has the largest number of energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components, um, let's consider maybe, uh, let, let's consider a couple things here. Um, so, let's make, let me make some room here. Suppose I have... I have two bulbs, okay, I have a glass chamber, and I have two bulbs. Let me draw that. So I have one bulb, there is a chamber, it's a sealed system, and there's another bulb. And I have the gas sample, so let me actually make little dots to show the gas sample and so the entire state A is that um, the entire sample is in one of the bulbs you can also envision that so this is one this is a second bulb you can also envision that the entire sample is in the second bulb and there is a third state in which you can perhaps envision that there is a 
distribution of the components. Let me put six so it's an even distribution. And so hopefully you can see that um, upon opening, upon opening of, uh, since you have an even distribution when the stopcock is opened, um, the energetically equivalent final states that are possible for these atoms is uh, most spread in the last case. And so that is why you would say that the entropy is going to be highest in this last state. So again, greater is the spread of um, the energy. Uh, you would say that greater will be the dispersal of the energy and hence higher will be the entropy for that system. Um, and we say this because when atoms are confined to one flask, so for example, the first flask or the second flask uh, for the states A and B, um, you would say that even the energy of those atoms is going to remain confined. It's not spread. And um, uh, that is the reason that you would say that um, uh, greater is the dispersal, uh, the probability, the arrangements that are possible. So within that, whether they would take up, whether it's a random uh, behavior that they are randomly placed or whether both of them are um, you know on the bottom one or both of them, both of them on top one um, those arrangements are going to be um, uh, variable and greater number two and so uh, for that reason since the energy is spread out over a greater volume you can consider energy is spread over a greater volume and uh, it is more dispersed therefore is more dispersed so hopefully now you would be able to again relate back to that um, example I gave you about uh, puncturing a balloon or you know getting a flat tire why is it that air um, always moves out it moves out because it's going from a confined space uh, with only specific energy states to now a greater volume where it can collide with other molecules that can move around to whichever direction it wants to so the disorderliness has increased uh, and hence um, you would say that the air always moves out of the balloon that's only a natural spontaneous process okay now second law of thermodynamics also explains many phenomena which maybe the first law does not explain in chapter six we discussed the first law where we said that it's always the energy transfer that takes place energy cannot be created from one form to another um, so for example if you take a beaker or a glass tumbler with water and you drop some ice cubes into it right um, over a period of time you would uh, see that uh, water was at room temperature uh, so heat is going to travel from water to ice it always is in that direction so from the source of heat to sink of heat it always is like that you will never expect that ice became cooler and water became warmer. That'll be a little weird thing. It'll be like, I don't know, ketchup on sushi. Um, but realize it would, it, it would just not work out. Uh, now you might wonder, uh, why is it that that uh, cannot take place uh, for a split second? Let's hypothesize that um, ice gets warmer uh, or I'm sorry, ice gets cooler. I can't even say that. <laughs> ice gets cooler. Let's hypothesize. So in blue, what I'm writing is the hypothesis that ice gets cooler. Ice gets cooler and water gets warmer when you mix, when you, when you add ice to water. Um, realize that uh, 
since in this case we are basically saying that uh, in, in this hypothesis we are basically saying that the heat transfer is going to occur from cold to hot that will violate the second law of thermodynamics because according to the second law the energy is dispersed it's not concentrated and we are saying that the substance which was warm is getting warmer so uh, we are saying that the energy is getting concentrated in the water and the transfer of heat from a substance of higher temperature to a substance of lower temperature the results in greater randomization that's just the natural thing so energy that was concentrated in the hot substance becomes dispersed between the two substances so realize um, that something as basic something as natural as when you put ice cubes into water uh, it's the ice which is absorbing heat from water water gets cooler ice gets warmer because heat is traveling from water to the ice not the other way around not uh, uh, the other way around because um, in that event you would say that heat is being concentrated um, uh, in water and that will sort of negate the purpose of entropy uh, essentially we are seeking dispersal of heat energy we are not seeking concentration of heat energy all right so with that let me bring you to uh, third law of thermodynamics and then we'll still go over a couple factors of uh, on which um, entropy depends um, third law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a perfectly ordered crystalline substance at zero degree uh, zero degree kelvin is zero so what it's saying is perfectly ordered crystalline substance first of all the difference between crystalline amorphous um, I want you to think about what you learned in chapter 11. Um, we defined amorphous, more like irregular shape, um, essentially, which, which doesn't have a, 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 a repetitive uh, unit cell, which, which gets repeated um, after every so many times. Uh, crystalline, on the other hand, is perfectly ordered. Um, it, it's, it's a proper shape, so those are proper shapes um, and of course we didn't go into the details of that uh, but the FCC and the BCC and the simple cube are the three kinds and we are saying that if it's a perfectly ordered crystalline material so that says there that basically is telling you that the solid has like no defect within its structure um, and at zero Kelvin so that means uh, zero Kelvin is the absolute temperature of course, it hasn't been achieved, um, but absolute zero, uh, we assume that all motion is going to become zero. No motion can be seen. And that is what is assumed. Um, realize, and I talked about this a uh, couple slides ago, I think it was in the last uh, video, that there are three kinds of motion. We have the translational motion, we have the rotational motion, rotation, rotational motion, and we have the vibrational motion, vibrational motion. Um, of course, when the energy is high, entropy is high, and maybe all three of these are possible. When the energy is low, entropy is low, um, a lot of times, uh, and especially in case of solids, because the molecules are right next to each other, of course, there is no question of molecule A moving to molecule B, because where is it going to? There's something already sitting there. So envision, you know, kind of like musical chairs. You're not going to go sit on top of somebody who's sitting, already sitting uh, on a chair. You're, you're seeking a vacant space. So um, translational motion is not possible. Rotation about an axis is not possible. The only thing that solids can actually go through is vibration so they can just they can just go tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock and uh, even at zero degrees uh, Kelvin which is absolute zero it is the lowest possible temperature um, we say that the vibration is going to stop as well it, it's going to slow down and there's going to be no motion so envision a scenario when there is no motion 
everything is kind of stand still. Uh, what do you expect? You expect that there cannot be any randomness. And so one can say that that will be the basal level of basal level of entropy and that value will basically be zero. So what we are measuring, if we were, if we start there, that that is what a perfect uh, crystal structure with no defects, because defect means randomness, disorderliness, that that basically means disorder. Um, so uh, if we have no defect and uh, they, we have no motion, so there is no source of uh, disorder. And if there is no source of disorder, uh, the entropy should be zero. And as temperature increases, of course, the kinetic energy is going to increase, motion is going to increase, and the entropy is going to increase as well. Keeping that in mind, realize that um, if, uh, according to third law of thermodynamics, the entropy of a perfect crystal, if that is zero at absolute zero, what we are going to measure at any other temperature um, is just going to be the difference so uh, with respect to that absolute zero value so absolute entropy a lot of times we refer to a concept of absolute entropy which is nothing but the entropy change of a substance taken from um, entropy of zero at zero kelvin to some other temperature that means let's say i want to measure the entropy uh, at 25 degrees celsius Okay, it's a perfectly crystalline substance, it's the same material, let's consider that, it's the same material, um, and uh, I want to measure the temperature at 25 degrees Celsius. So whatever I'm measuring at this temperature, it, with respect to that absolute zero, I'm using a word which will be absolute entropy, but it's nothing but the change, the difference between the final entropy at 25 degrees Celsius and the initial temp uh, entropy uh, when it was at absolute zero. Of course, we haven't. It's a hypothetical concept, um, but it tells you, it gives you information. It makes life easy in terms of measurement, in terms of um, uh, in terms of experiment, because getting uh, the absolute numbers can sometimes be pain in the you know where. Um, all right, so. Uh, the third concept that I want to talk about is the concept of standard molar entropy, which a lot of times you would see written as S0, and that is nothing but the absolute entropy of one mole of substance. So molar entropy, that tells you that it is for one mole of a substance when it is present in its standard state. So the question is, what is standard state? I am not too sure if everybody remembers this or not from... Um, general chemistry one but standard state basically refers to a state where pressure is 1 atm temperature is 298 kelvin if you have a solution we will be talking about a one molar solution um, and so uh, essentially how nature it intended it to be that's what we say steady state or steady standard state either of the two phrases is fine um, so when we are measuring the absolute entropy, if we are doing that measurement uh, for one mole of the substance, we are going to refer to it as S0. So that is zero is for the fact that it is being done at standard state. All right. Now, before I go over the math for the entropy, uh, let's take a look at, you know, a couple things. Um, we already have discussed previously <clears throat> that entropy of gas is going to be highest, entropy of the solid is going to be least, and that's pretty self-explanatory because in case of solids, the molecular shape, the molecular structure doesn't allow for the molecules to jump around from one spot to another. The only thing, the only kind of motion that they have is um, the vibrational motion. In case of liquids, they have a little bit translational, they have a little bit rotation, a little bit vibration. Gases are the ones where the distance of separation between the molecules is enormous and so the kind of motion the kind of tumbling colliding with uh, other molecules that is allowed and so entropy of gases is going to be highest 
So the graph over here shows you it's a graph between entropy on y-axis and temperature. Uh, and if you notice, uh, as you increase the temperature, the entropy increases and then it becomes kind of like vertical which is the entropy of fusion that is the temperature at zero degrees where the entire amount of solid is getting converted into the liquid and then when it reaches 100 degrees celsius again um, the temperature stops to increase the temperature is constant but the entropy increases dramatically it's like a vertical vertical curve because and also notice that the um, the extent of the difference uh, in going from liquid to gas is way higher as compared to the extent between solid to liquid and the reason for that is because um, when it goes from liquid to gas all of a sudden you have broken all forces of interaction that were present in between the molecules the molecules are free and so um, the amount of entropy rise is also going to be uh, gigantic but while it's happening while that phase transition takes place you do not see um, you do not see a change in temperature realize that temperature becomes constant uh, so till the time that entire um, uh, phase transition has been completed temperature is not going to rise um, I also want to get to your attention the shape of this curve notice it's not like a linear curve like this and then like that it's kind of like curvy and then and then curvy and then rises so what's the deal with those slight curves um, realize of course as you increase the temperature uh, the entropy is going to increase but when you add heat to um, to a heated system uh, it causes smaller increases uh, in entropy than when you do it at a lower temperature so uh, the the uh, gases or the liquids they are going to show sort of greater amount of curves as compared to um, as compared to the solid for instance so um, long story short what's the take home net take home uh, from the situation the gaseous state is more disordered than the liquid state which in turn is more disordered than the solid state and one can even see this that uh, the difference in entropy is related to, since it's related to the number of energetically equivalent ways of arranging the particles in each state, you have find more of those states in case of gases as compared to liquids, as compared to solids. Or another way to say the same thing, when you have a solid get into a liquid form, so solid to liquid and liquid to gas, uh, you basically have newer places to spread that energy to. Newer places to spread the energy to in case of gases. So one can see that gases will have more possible microstates than the solids and that is why it is going to have a greater amount of entropy. Right. Um, other trends that entropy depends on, one is the complexity of the structure. I want you to compare, uh, this is a, a methane, uh, ethane, propane and butane. And notice that uh, we are basically increasing the number of carbon atoms and hence the chain length. So if you think about how the chain is going to sit, for example, um, in three-dimensional space, I just drew pentane. Let's get rid of one carbon. Okay. Um, whether the chain sits like this or whether the chain sits like that or whether the chain sits like this or whether the chain sits, how exactly the chain sits is going to be in a three-dimensional space. It's still the same molecule, but uh, those are considered different microstates. Um, also, uh, every carbon is going to bring with it the electronics, right? And how the electron or which orbital that electron is going to be, uh, whether it's going to be alpha spin, beta spin, the permutation and combinations are way too many. So because of the increase in the number of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, in other words, the complexity of the structure, um, one would say that entropy is going to be higher in case of uh, butane and it's going to be lesser in case of uh, methane so if you are given 
If you're given, uh, you know, uh, various different molecules, uh, you can look at the formula or you can look at the molecular mass. Higher the molecular mass, greater is the complexity. And that would mean that um, it will have a higher uh, entropy. So, for instance, if you have, let's say, hydrogen gas, let's compare that to helium. Let's compare that to bromine, Br2, and maybe fluorine. So Br2 is the biggest, and that's, that will have the greatest uh, entropy in a molar sense, of course. All right. Um, entropy can also be uh, different on the basis of the allotropic differences in the structure. Um, so the first things first, what are allotropes? Allotropes are forms of the elements which have different physical properties but same chemical properties. So a great example of this is diamond, which is a form of carbon. It's a sparkly form of carbon, form of carbon. And graphite, which is present in your pencil, or in the, the graphite powder, which is present in the, uh, in the uh, locks, you know, the anti, not locks, but the um, anti-corrosive powder that you get at Lowe's that you can just squirt into your uh, lock if your lock gets stuck and it just lubricates and makes it better. Hopefully you're not using WD-40 because WD-40 is going to eat away the internal machinery of the lock. So keep that in mind. Now you know something. All right. Um, so diamond forms uh, uh, is a form of carbon. So is graphite. But if you envision the two things, diamonds, the, the ad on TV from Zales is what? Diamonds are be girl's best friend or whatever. And it's all sparkly and uh, shiny. And if you think about graphite, you use it to write. It breaks easily too. What do we know about diamond? that it is a covalent network solid. It doesn't uh, break easily. It's actually the hardest material known and is used in a diamond pencil. I, we talked about this. I told you the diamond is used in a diamond pencil to cut a mirror and, 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 and glass all the time. Um, and why do we say that diamond is, um, it has such a, such a, uh, uh, you know, hardness associated with it. The reason for that is because it has that sp3 hybridized network of each of each carbon going to other carbon. So it's all sp3 hybridized carbon atoms bound to each other. In case of graphite, you have sp2 hybridized carbons. So you have these layers, these hexagonal layers, which kind of slide over each other. So that is the reason why it's softer, why it's... Um, why it's, uh, um, you know, um, it can conduct, why it's softer, why it can break easily, why it can be used as a lubricant. Um, so physical properties are different, but if you burn diamond into um, in, 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 um, air, you're going to get CO2. If you take graphite and you burn that in air, you're going to get CO2 too. So you're going to basically generate carbon dioxide in, in both the cases. One happens to be a little bit more expensive than the other. But um, other than that, there's no real difference between the two. So if somebody asks you which one will have um, a higher entropy, hopefully you can see that since in case of graphite there is movement, um, there is additional modes of motion, the entropy is going to be higher as compared to diamond which has limited modes of motion in its structure okay let's then take a look uh, we we, we uh, learned about the standard molar entropy s not a couple of minutes ago it's the entropy of one mole of pure substance at uh, one atmospheric pressure and specific temperature, usually that temperature is 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius. Um, how do we measure a standard entropy of a reaction? So this is similar to what you learned uh, for enthalpy in uh, chapter 6 in Gen Chem 1, where you're given 
and what you do is you consolidate all uh, enthalpy so we did what we did in um, uh, chapter 6 was delta H0 reaction and we said that we are going to consolidate all of the delta H's of the products and we are going to consolidate all the delta H's of the reactants and since product is the final state, reactant is the initial state, we'll just go product minus reactants. It's the exact same thing that we are going to do in this case also. But we are going to call this now entropy of the reaction rather than the heat of the reaction or enthalpy of the reaction. And again, the way you would do is you would consolidate all the product entropies together based on one mole of substance. So if you, um, if you have to determine... Uh, that for a given reaction you must first make sure that you have a balanced equation and you will need to multiply it by the number of moles so the value that you are given for the standard uh, molar entropy that is for one mole and you of course will need to multiply it by the uh, subsequent uh, by the specific number of moles in accordance with the balanced chemical equation and I'll give you examples to tell you exactly what I mean um, but realize that one way to determine the entropy of the reaction is that you consolidate all the products together from that you subtract the reactants and that will give you your um, entropy for the reaction let's apply that uh, for a gener for a generic uh, reaction the reaction i have here is a moles of a react with b of b to give you c of c and d of d and if you had to determine delta s0 you would say well c and d are my products and i'm getting c moles of c so whatever is my the molar entropy, I'm going to multiply that by the number of moles. Likewise, I'm going to multiply the number of moles for D. And we, are, we are going to consolidate that together as the products. And from that, I'm going to subtract out my entropy values for my reactants. And um, once I have that, um, I can determine my delta S from there. Let's see if we can apply that on a real problem. The question here is, calculate the standard entropy of the reaction at 25 degrees Celsius for the decomposition of calcium carbonate. So it's a pretty straightforward reaction. You have calcium carbonate, which is undergoing decomposition upon heating, and it gives you CaO and CO2. Uh, the first things, that, first things first, the number one thing I want you to do is to verify that the equation is balanced. So hopefully you can see one calcium on each side, a carbon on each side, two plus one oxygen. That's balanced as well. Um, so how do we set the delta S0 for the reaction? Notice these numbers that are given are basically absolute numbers uh, uh, for each of the material so I'm going to consolidate the products first um, for CaO since I have only one mole I would simply go 39.7 plus I have one mole of CO2 so that's 213.6 from that I'm going to subtract out 92.9 notice the entropy value for CO2 was like pretty high as compared to the other two numbers also notice CaCO3 has a higher molecular weight, so the complexity of the structure is greater and that entropy was higher than CaO. So these are kind of trends that we saw um, a couple minutes ago as we were discussing that. Um, so let me just punch in these numbers, 39.7 plus 213.6 from that I'm going to subtract out 92.9 and that's 160.4 now one thing that I would suggest is um, joules per Kelvin is the units I'm not going to use the mole because realize I did actually multiply these by one each um, it just turns out that the number of moles in this case is one uh, but the the difference in entropy does not have does not include the per mole component. Um, the one thing that I was saying is um, you should be careful with the math when you are working this out in a test because this will be uh, a part of the final and the part of the fourth exam and both of those exams you don't have to show your work. Um, so what that means is oh, you have you'll be picking some 
uh, you know choices and if you uh, don't have the correct signs or let's say you went instead of product minus reactants accidentally you wrote reactants minus products that's a wrong thing and it's a possibility that you know you might pick uh, the wrong choice uh, from there so again uh, make sure I would very strongly recommend um, that you uh, put down the math on paper before and then punch in. Don't try to do that directly on the calculator. That is one reason why about 50% of the class gets the wrong answer. You go directly to the calculator and then, you know, before you know it, there's a problem already. Now, we saw an earlier example where I gave you the example of freezing of water, which increases the entropy of the surroundings because um, as water converts into water converts into ice it has to lose energy and that means it's an exothermic reaction and if it's exothermic that means that heat is going to go into the surroundings and it's going to increase the temperature of the surroundings and hence you can perhaps envision that the molecules there would have more number of microstates where that they could occupy and so uh, we, we, we say that freezing of water is a non-spontaneous process at all temperatures. That means uh, if the temperature is more than zero degrees Celsius, it's non-spontaneous. Uh, only at lower temperatures, it's spontaneous. And the question is why? Well, because the magnitude of the increase in entropy of the surroundings due to the dispersal of energy into the surroundings is a temperature-dependent quantity. And that is the reason that um, this process will become um, will become non-spontaneous at higher temperatures. So greater is the temperature. What we are saying is that greater is the temperature, smaller is the increase in entropy for the given amount of uh, energy dispersed into the surroundings. Recall in that graph also where we had sort of, you know, curvy lines. Uh, that's exactly the reason for that as well. Um, and so realize that entropy is a measure of, again, energy dispersal joules per um, unit Kelvin. And if you have higher temperatures, then the lower the amount of entropy for a given amount of energy dispersed. So it's sort of like a uh, inverse relationship. So you can perhaps understand this um, dependence of entropy uh, changes due to the heat flow with a simple analogy that if you have to maybe, let's say, uh, uh, give away a $1,000, all right. Now, if you give that to a rich man, the impact on his net worth would be negligible because he already has so much money. On the other hand, if you give the thousand dollars to a poor man, then his net worth would change substantially because he has so little money. So likewise, if you had to disperse a thousand joules of energy into the surroundings that are already hot, the entropy increase is going to be small because the impact of the uh, thousand joules uh, is small on the surroundings that already contains a lot of energy. On the other hand, if the same thousand joules of energy is um, uh, going to the surroundings that are cold, then the entropy increase is large. And so um, for, that for that reason, the impact of the heat released to the surroundings by the freezing water uh, depends on the temperature. Higher the temperature, smaller is the impact. So hopefully you can now understand why water spontaneously freezes at low temperatures, but not at high temperatures. And so for that matter, um, freezing of liquid water into ice. So if you're going from water to ice, um, the change in entropy between the two, uh, the change in entropy for the system is going to be negative. So um, delta S universe is equal to delta S system plus delta S surroundings. And so since this guy is a negative number um, and delta S surrounding is a positive number, that is a large number if the temperature is low, 
On the other hand, it is a negative number and a small number at high temperatures and a small number at high T. What would that mean? That would mean that the delta S universe is going to remain a negative value at high temperatures and it would become or has a chance to become a positive value um, at low temperatures. Again, another reason in order to result in a positive delta S universe and hence a spontaneous process, you want to keep to the temperatures lower for this particular case. Um, okay. So in terms of graph, let me just show that and kind of re recap what we have seen previously. What we have just said is that the delta S universe universe is um, is small. And the reason why it's a small positive quantity is if your delta S system is a negative number and the delta S surrounding delta S surrounding is a positive value uh, provided the temperature is low. Now we have another uh, situation that delta S system is a negative number and delta S surrounding is not very positive and the temperature is high. In that event your overall delta S universe is going to be a negative value so that's the case for the high temperature we saw these graphs uh, previously but just to kind of recap that all right so uh, if you had to quantify these entropy changes into the surrounding you would say that when a system exchanges heat with the surroundings um, it changes the entropy of the surroundings so if you have a constant pressure if you have a constant pressure, you can use the heat of the system to quantify uh, the change in entropy. So in general, you can say that when there is a process that emits heat into the surroundings, uh, the heat of the system is considered, is considered negative and what we like to call the delta H as a negative value and that increases the entropy of the surrounding entropy of surrounding so one can say that exothermic processes lead to increase in increase in the delta s surrounding on the other hand if there is a process that absorbs the heat from the surrounding that means if you have an endothermic process in that case the delta s since you're taking away the temperature, the microstates are decreasing, the delta S is going to be a negative value, or you can say that the delta S is going to decrease. So one can say that the magnitude of change in entropy is proportional to the magnitude of the enthalpy of the system, or the delta S surrounding is um, proportional to the energy of the system. And for that matter, um, we have also seen that for a given amount of heat exchange with the surroundings, the magnitude of delta S, the delta S is inversely proportional to the temperature, right? So if you combine the two things, you can say that delta S surrounding is going to be proportional to negative Q system over T and so for a constant temperature you can remove the sign of proportionality and put an equal at a specific temperature you can say that the heat of the system uh, can actually give you the entropy of the surroundings for that particular situation so this QS is nothing but enthalpy um, and we use the negative sign because it's for the exothermic reaction okay let's let's see if we can actually apply this um, onto a question let's the question is consider the combustion of propane gas so you're given propane C3H8 and that reacts with oxygen gives you three co2 
plus 4H2O. The delta H for this reaction is negative 2044 kilojoules. So that means this is your exothermic reaction, the delta H system is what it is. The question is that you're supposed to calculate the entropy change in surroundings. Entropy change of surroundings. So delta S surrounding is what we are uh, looking at, at 25 degrees Celsius. And then you have to determine the uh, sign of entropy change of the system. Sign of entropy change of system and what else let's take a look um, you have to determine the sign of entropy change of the universe and so you have to predict uh, if the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not okay um, so a couple things here, um, you have to determine delta S surrounding, so we just learned that delta S surrounding is equal to delta H system, with a negative sign of course, um, over the temperature, and since this is an exothermic reaction, so negative of negative 2044 divided by T is 25 degrees, so 25 plus 273 is going to be 298. So I'm going to divide that by 298, and that gives me 6.86 kilojoules per Kelvin, or you can say it's 6.86 .86 times 10 to the third joules per Kelvin. Now, um, so this is part A. Let's take a look at part B. I have to determine the sign of entropy change for the system. Notice what I have for my reactants and products. I have C3H8, which is propane, which is a gas. Oxygen is a gas. Uh, carbon dioxide is a gas. And water is a gas as well. So everything is a gas. I have total 1 plus 5, 6 moles on the reactant side, side 3 plus 4, 7 moles on the product side. So that means since I'm going from less number of moles to greater number of gas moles, um, the delta S of the system should be positive. So if delta S of the system, system is positive and delta S of surroundings is also positive, you know that delta S universe is a combination of system, system plus surroundings. And if both of those are positive, then the overall delta S of the, of the universe is also going to be a positive value. And positive delta S means spontaneous reaction. So once the burning occurs, it's going to sustain itself. So what we have learned so far in terms of our relationship of the change in the entropy of the universe is that delta S universe is nothing but delta S system plus delta S surroundings. And we also saw that delta S surroundings can be written as negative delta H system over temperature, right? And uh, so if I multiply both sides of the equation by T, I can say T delta S universe is going to be T delta S system minus delta H system, right? Um, or if I multiply the whole thing by a negative sign, I could say negative delta T S universe is going to be equal to delta H system minus T delta S system, right? 
Now, um, of course, you know, if you are uh, thinking about um, system, which is, of course, your point of study, you don't have to really specify the subscript system each time. So you can simply just say that T delta S universe is nothing but delta H minus T delta S. Now, <clears throat> the right hand side basically represents uh, the change in the thermodynamic function. This part is nothing but the Gibbs free energy delta G, uh, which, it, which is at a constant temperature. So if we combine the two equations, we can safely say that delta G is going to be equal to negative T delta S universe. Um, provided the temperature and the pressure are constant. So what that means is that change in Gibbs free energy, like what does it mean physically, what does it mean? Change in the Gibbs free energy for a process that occurs at a constant temperature, constant temperature and pressure, if those are constant, um, then it is proportional to the negative of the delta S universe. So realize we have been saying all along that uh, the the uh, entropy change of the universe has to increase it has to increase it has to increase and now we are saying that delta g would be negative of that number so that is how earlier when i said uh, for for this chapter that the delta g has to be a negative value this is what it stems from since delta S universe was the criterion for spontaneity and delta G is also a criterion for uh, for spontaneity, however, with the opposite sign, you can say that the Gibbs free energy, uh, which is sometimes also referred to as chemical uh, potential, um, essentially, uh, and it refers to the usable work, the usable work or free energy for usable work. Free, free energy for usable work. Um, that must be, it must have a negative sign. So what all have we learned? What have we summarized so far? We have said that delta G is proportional to negative of the delta S universe. Um, that means a decrease in delta G is going to lead to a spontaneous process and an increase is going to lead to a non-spontaneous process, non-spontaneous process. Now, all right, let's then discuss free energy. So again, uh, the Gibbs free energy, the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. This is the only direct relationship between these three components that actually always holds up. So if somebody asks you between delta G, delta H or delta S, which one is sort of the, uh, you know, the one uh, measure which will always tell you complete information about spontaneity, it is the delta G. Um, you don't have to worry about the system or the surrounding because you always will be making the measurements with respect to the system and system alone so if that value is less than zero it's a negative number it's a spontaneous process but again somebody might ask well what is a Gibbs free energy physically and realize again it is the energy available to do some useful work you so useful work is like uh, moving a car or you know applying force so that some distance has been moved um, and in the process uh, has energy dispersed through the universe or not. Um, so how do we decide? The question is, how do we decide when a reaction is spontaneous? Because realize we have two different components here, the delta H and the, and the delta S, and um, it's going to look, you know, where there are various different permutation combinations <coughs> available for these. So recall from what you learned in chapter 6 um, in Gen Chem 1 that the internal energy is equal to Q plus W which is the heat 
uh, plus work and um, of course um, if you if you compare that to uh, you know the I just gave you an example of movement of a car so just gasoline combustion comes first to your head um, uh, m most of the energy actually ends up being wasted as heat to the surroundings and it's not actually used to move the car so uh, out of the three enthalpy which is essentially the chemical energy which is stored in the bonds uh, free energy is the usable form but again it's not 100 percent efficient we would like it to be 100 percent efficient but no machine so far uh, has been achieved which uh, which gives you 100 percent efficiency and um, entropy uh, of course is that dispersed energy so the heat which is being lost that's the entropy component um, so hopefully you can see that entropy is going to ultimately culminate as the uh, the Q and the work that is being done is going to ultimately culminate as the free energy and since it's being studied at constant pressure um, the two will add up to give you the delta H, the enthalpy. So I want to take some time um, to go through the various different cases uh, for delta H and delta S and give you a little bit of an idea of what's spontaneous, what's not, before we start applying uh, these to our, uh, you know, uh, numerical problems. Let's consider our first scenario for the Gibbs free energy equation that our delta H is negative and the delta S is positive. This is sort of like a dream come true because if your reaction is exothermic, that means the heat is less than zero and the entropy change is positive, then the free energy is going to be negative at all temperatures. Why is that? Because realize the first term is going to be a negative term. The second term is a positive and no matter what the value of the temperature is that overall is going to remain a negative value and two negatives will give you a negative delta G. So this is you know like I said it's going to be a spontaneous reaction at all temperatures. Spontaneous at all temperatures. Um, so just to kind of give you an example for this, let's say you have 2N2O, which is in the gas phase, and that gives you O2, and the delta H0 for the reaction is a negative value. So it's an exothermic process. So since it's exothermic, the delta H is a negative number. Um, you start, you begin with two moles in the gas phase. You end up with three. You end up with three. So the entropy is increasing. The change in enthalpy is negative. Heat is emitted and that increases the entropy of the surroundings. And change in entropy is positive for the system, which means that the entropy of the system increases so both surrounding and system are increasing and that is going to ultimately increase the universe entropy and so this reaction will be spontaneous at all times um if you if you compare a second case so what i just said again maybe i should just say one more time since delta h system is negative and you know that delta s surrounding was nothing but negative of the delta h system over temperature and this value is a negative value negative and negative will become positive so this guy will become positive and if it becomes positive and because of the number of moles delta s system is also positive and you know that universe is nothing but system plus surrounding system plus surrounding two positive things is going to add up to give you something positive and that tells you that it's going to be spontaneous at all times let's take a second case scenario so let me make room first to discuss uh, a delta H positive so it's an endothermic process and delta S negative. Let's consider that. 
Okay, so let's consider the second. So this was case one. Case two is that delta H is positive. It's an endothermic process and delta S is negative. So this is just the opposite of what, uh, uh, what we just saw. What that means is that uh, the negative of the delta S is going to react with the negative of the negative T delta S component. So overall, that is going to become a positive value. So irrespective of what the temperature is, this reaction is going to be non-spontaneous. Now, again, non-spontaneous doesn't mean that it's going to be um, an impossible reaction. It just means that it's not going to take place on its own. Um, so it needs uh, some kind of uh, trigger, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, a driving force uh, to keep going. So, for instance, if you consider um, perhaps conversion of ozone, um, so formation of ozone from oxygen. So you have oxygen, that's going to give you uh, ozone. And this reaction does require energy. The delta H is uh, positive to 85.4, which usually is brought about with an electric spark. So that electric spark actually does the trick. So, um, Notice that you have three uh, moles of gas on the reactant side. You have only two moles of gas on the product side. So delta S system is a negative value. Since it's an endothermic process, that tells you that the delta S surrounding, the delta S surrounding is also a negative value. Um, and so that means that both of those are pointing downwards that means the universe is going to be very very negative and if it's negative then um, of course the delta G is going to be a positive value just different ways of looking at the same the same thing all right let's take a look at uh, so this is a non-spontaneous process at all temperatures let's take a look at two more cases I want to think about um, uh, exothermic process with negative delta S and I want to talk about an endothermic process with a positive delta S. So let's consider case 3. Case 3. So it's an exothermic process and the entropy is negative. So how, how, how is that going to pan out? Um, realize since uh, I have a negative uh, value for, for the delta H and I have a negative value for the delta S, that means the negative of the delta S and the negative of the T delta S is going to give you a positive number. And if the temperature is too large, and if the temperature is too large and, um, you know, it uh, makes the T delta S term greater than the delta H term, then the overall delta G is going to be a positive value. And so it will become non-spontaneous. On the other hand, if the T, so this is at high temperatures, high T. Uh, on the other hand, if... Um, the temperature is low, then there is a greater likelihood that the delta H is going to be greater than the T delta S, and so it will be overall a negative value, and that would mean that it is going to be a spontaneous process. That means that if your entropy is entropy of the system, if that is a negative value, reaction is going to take place um, uh, reaction is going to take place at low temperatures and a great example of that is freezing of water H2O liquid becoming H2O solid since you're going from liquid to solid uh, that basically means that your uh, delta S is a negative value so delta S system is negative 
And since it's an exothermic reaction, since it's an exothermic reaction, exothermic reaction, um, essentially the delta H is a negative value and that would mean that the delta S surroundings is going to be a positive value, right? So this is a scenario where um, the system is negative, surrounding is positive, so uh, it should be so positive that the overall the delta s of the universe uh, remains positive um, so in this case uh, realize that the changes of entropy of the system and surrounding uh, are of opposite sign in this case so the overall change in free energy is going to depend be dependent on those relative magnitudes so if you have low temperatures and you know that water freezes we spent a lot of time discussing that um, if the temperatures are low enough that the heat emitted into the surroundings causes a large um, entropy change that will make the process spontaneous and if you have a high temperature then the same amount of heat is dispersed into warmer surroundings so the positive energy um, or entropy change rather in the surrounding is going to be smaller and that will give you the um, the non-spontaneous process if you're a person who believes in math what we are just saying is that delta s delta s surrounding is equal to negative delta H system over T. So if T is high, if this is high, then the delta S surrounding is going to be tiny. And so that might mean that the delta S universe can become a negative value. On the other hand, if T is low, that would mean that the delta S is going to remain very high. And that would mean the delta S universe is going to be a positive value. And that ultimately culminates into the T delta S being an overall um, overall smaller number as compared to the delta H leading to the H the delta H minus T delta S uh, to be to be a negative value and hence a spontaneous process um, let's take a look at the last case um, my last case is that we have an endothermic process and the entropy is also increasing so uh, uh, an ideal case in this case to compare would be like water liquid becoming water gaseous so entropy is increasing that's why the positive sign positive sign for delta H because it requires energy so hopefully you can see that as you increase the temperature um, high temperatures will increase the negative T delta S component that will become more negative and so your delta G will become a negative value so spontaneous at high temperatures and non-spontaneous at low temperatures and that makes sense because water boils really well that conversion from liquid phase to gas phase is going to be facilitated very well if you uh, increase the temperature if you're at like 100 degrees or higher steam is going to get formed no doubt about it on the other hand if you are maintaining let's say 10 degrees it's going to be a slower process it's not that it's not going to take place but it's not going to be a facile feasible process um so those are the four scenarios, four cases, uh, and again, the spontaneity um, will be dependent on the overall delta G value. That has to be a negative, um, negative uh, uh, number. Um, the one thing that hopefully you uh, may have noticed here is that um, that the delta H and delta S. When those have opposite signs, then the spontaneity of the reaction um, uh, does not depend on the temperature. So right over here, when you have the negative delta H and positive delta S, or if you have positive delta H and negative delta S, essentially uh, whatever uh, answers you get, you get that for all temperatures on the other hand when delta h and delta s have the same sign so both negative both positive that is where 
the temperature dependence uh, comes in. So the temperature at which the reaction changes from being spontaneous to being non-spontaneous is the temperature at which the delta G will change the sign. And so essentially the delta G of zero would be where, where um, you, would, you would find the equilibrium to be. And so by setting delta G to be equal to zero, you can solve for the temperature and determine at what temperature it becomes spontaneous or not. Let's apply this exact idea, this last sentence that I just said, um, how we can apply that to a real numerical problem. So... The last slide, essentially, I gave you the four different case scenarios and I told you that when the delta H and the delta S have opposite signs, um, that is the time where there is no temperature dependence. On the other hand, when both of them have the same signs, we do see temperature dependence in that case. And so... Uh, the temperature going from low to high or high to low um, is is the point of time where the delta G is going to change um, change signs. Uh, it'll be to your advantage to uh, set delta G to be equal to zero in in such case scenarios and be able to determine that um, uh, accordingly. Let's see if we can apply this. Now the question is, consider the decomposition uh, of gaseous N2O4. And N2O4 is uh, going from N2O4 to, to NO2. And the delta H is a positive value, 57.1 kilojoules. And the delta S is a positive value as well. It's a plus 175.8 so notice the sign for both of these is a positive uh, sign and when the signs are the same then the temperature dependence is there there are two questions uh, the first one says is this reaction spontaneous under standard state conditions uh, at 25 degrees celsius and then it asks you uh, estimate the temperature at which the reaction becomes spontaneous the fact that they're asking, first of all, the fact that they're asking that they want you to estimate the temperature, probably the answer to this will be no. But we still have to prove our point. And how do we prove our point? We will have to basically determine the delta G. And since delta G is nothing but delta H minus T delta S, I'm going to plug in the values for the delta H and the delta S. Make sure that the units are exactly the same. So you'll probably need to multiply the 57.1 by a thousand so that it's in joules. And that will come out to be 57100 minus 25 degrees Celsius is nothing but 298 Kelvin. So I'm going to multiply 298 times 175.8 and if I can make the calculation and plug in the number let's see 298 times 175.8 that gives you 52388.52388.4 with a negative sign and 57100 with a positive sign so your overall answer is going to come out to be 4711.6 joules per Kelvin. No, just joules per Kelvin is going to cancel off. Okay. It's a positive sign, and since it's a positive sign, you would say that since delta G is positive, we would say that this is a non-spontaneous process at 25 degrees Celsius. So then what is that temperature at which this will become uh, spontaneous, right? That's what we have to figure out. So in order to determine that, notice that this is a case similar to that water vaporization case. Um, so high temperatures is what is uh, what we would be seeking. In order to determine that, like I said in the previous slide, you should set delta G to be equal to zero. And so plug in your um, delta H value, 57100 
minus let the temperature be and delta s is going to be uh, delta s is going to be 175.8 and that is equal to zero and so you would get 57100 that's your numerator and you're going to divide that number by 175.8 and that will give you 324.8 Kelvin temperature comes out to be 324.8 Kelvin so any temperature that is greater than 324.8 Kelvin um, and you will start seeing a negative delta uh, G in that case so at 324.8 delta G is at equilibrium but any temperature higher than that and you would start seeing uh, uh, essentially uh, you know a negative delta G um, I have always remembered this as you know delta H positive delta S positive and high temperature so you know positive in my head high temperature since it's increasing um, and when you have exothermic reaction delta S is minus low temperature so that's a minus decreasing is what I have associated with but you can uh, make up your own mnemonic if you want to